Well, welcome back. This video will be part two of Robot Upright, building your own CNC. Part one appears to have been well received. I'll take that as a sign to keep on yapping. Jumping right in, let's recap what we did in that first 30 minute video. That's it. That is basically all we did. We talked about all this stuff and wired it together. The motors that turn the Etch-a-Sketch are wired to the motor drivers, the drivers are wired to the control board, everything's got power from a power supply, and the control board, in this case, is connected via USB to my laptop. You don't have to use this stuff I'm showing you here. Just go on eBay or Amazon or walk down to your local Kmart and look for a CNC kit. Buy the one that strikes your fancy or is within your budget. But for now, suffice it to say that almost any hardware or software you decide to get will require the same basic setup we did here, or are doing here. We have to get the blips that are generated by the computer to the motors in a language they understand. That's what all this stuff does. As you may have noticed if you read the comments in that last video, and as I mentioned in part one, there are cheaper ways to do this. You could gut steppers out of an old photocopier, steal a few skateboards or roller blades from the kids in your neighborhood, rip out two or three vinyl windows, and build your own CNC machine by programming it the long way around. All of which might set you back, I don't know, 50 bucks maybe? That includes the ski mask, pry bar, and voice changer. Now frankly, if you know how to do that, this probably isn't the video for you. You should be off doing something more suited to your skill set, like colonizing Mars. Oh, pardon me. That sound means I got a message from the future. I should take this. Cut us some slack. We're on our lunch break watching the oldies. Well, cool. Shout out to Mars Terraforming Union Local 26. In this video, we're talking primarily about the software. What witchcraft I use to get these motors to spin when I push the arrow keys. Before we do, however, let me show you a couple of additions I made since the last time we met. We said this control board, the PMDX424, can control up to four axes. Technically five motors, but two of those motors would be on the same axe. It also offers screw terminal connections for inputs and outputs. So four axes, 11 inputs, and I believe four outputs. For demonstration purposes, I've taken the liberty of wiring two switches into two of the inputs on the board. One is your regular old run-of-the-mill red nuclear launch switch. The other is an NPN proximity sensor. Now, both of these do the same exact thing. The switch is, well, just a switch. Push the button and the board sees that as a call to action to whatever you might have programmed it to do in the software. When you push that button, the board sees it, the computer sees it, and responds accordingly. The proximity sensor, or switch, does the same exact thing except it has no button. Instead, it'll activate when it comes near something metallic. It has an LED in the back that shows you that it's functioning. But when it gets near something metal, it switches just like the regular switch did, sending a signal to the board. For now, these are the only two inputs we have. Again, these are used for limit switches. When your router, lathe, or CNC pizza cutter gets all the way to one side or the other of the machine, these are what tell the computer it's run out of space. You don't have to use limit switches. I don't recommend running without them, but you don't have to. You can use traditional limit switches to do the same exact thing. They work just fine. Yeah, they wouldn't look like this. They'd look like one of these. This one happens to be broken, but it's the same idea. Some part of your machine gets too close for comfort, trips the switch, tells the computer. Anyway, the inputs are important, but let's move on to the outputs, which might be more exciting. Apart from the motor outputs we wired before, these connections do the fun stuff of turning on your spindle, your Dremel, your pizza cutter, your hydraulic pants remover, turn on lights, whatever you want. We said this board has four outputs. There's three there on the output terminal block. Those are signal outputs, low voltage, low power, TTL kind of stuff. And one of them is routed through a relay and up to a terminal block at the top of the board where you see those two yellow wires. So one, two, three, four outputs. Control boards, as cool as they might be, are full of these teeny tiny little little components, and they're connected by even smaller copper traces on the PCB itself. You can't really use them to turn on just any old thing, not on their own anyway. If you tried to run enough power through these connections to sound the foghorn you put behind your wife's nightstand, well, this board won't last long. In fact, it'd likely go up in a brilliant puff of smoke. These outputs here can handle about 5 volts and 24 milliamps. At 0.024 amps. Compare that to your foghorn, which might require 100 amps. There's a big difference, like 500,000% difference. That's not to say you can't control that stuff. You just need something suitable as a go-between. That something suitable is almost always a relay. Now this is a small relay, maybe 5 amps. 
maybe half an amp, any more than that and it would explode. But this can take a small signal, a small current on one side, say 24 milliamps from the board, and control a larger current, a larger signal on the other side, in this case up to half an amp. Think of it like a car. When you turn a key in your ignition switch or a screwdriver in someone else's ignition switch, you're not directly turning over the engine to get it started like those old timey crank cars. Your key, ignition switch, battery, all that junk is switching on a relay, a bigger relay than this one. One, telling it to send a ton of current to the starter motor, which in turn is turning your engine. With that in mind, let's have a quick look at this little bird's nest I've connected to the PMDX. Using output one, that's the white wire, I want to control a small DC motor. The control board itself, on its own, doesn't have the power to drive that motor, or not for very long anyway. So just like in your car, unless you're still driving a Model T, I've got a battery and a relay to do the heavy lifting. Now for kicks, I've torn the cover off this relay. Thought it'd be more fun to see what's going on inside. I don't recommend you do that. In fact, I don't recommend you use mechanical relays at all unless you're trying to push some insane current through something. These are also very noisy, electrically speaking, but we'll save that for later. You'd likely want to use a solid state relay with no moving parts in it, but one of those wouldn't have as much pizzazz here. With this setup, the board now only need turn a key as it were, expending very little effort to do that, and the relay connects these two wires, sending power from the battery to the motor, which is much more power than the board could supply on its own. This is jumping the gun here, but I feel like I need to pay that off. The board's powered up, the computer's powered up. When I click the mouse button, it's going to activate output one, which energizes the relay and gets this motor spinning. Just to beat this horse dead, and for the benefit of anyone out there watching that might not be familiar with this stuff, when output one on the board goes high, when it turns on, it sends a very small amount of current through a very large number of turns of small wire, that copper wire, turning this orange cylinder thing you see into an electromagnet. That magnet pulls on, in this case, an L-shaped piece of metal, and that piece of metal shoves some stuff around in such a way that it closes the contacts. It's a switch operated by a magnet. In this case, it's connecting the blue and white wires you see on the left, which just happens to be the connection between the 9-volt battery and the motor. You can get them in all sorts of flavors, but this relay has two normally closed contacts. They call them that because when there is no power, normally, they're closed. And two normally open contacts. When that little beam pushes the contacts around, the normally open ones close, and the normally closed ones open. That gives you two options to wire with this relay. Heavens, look at me. I'm getting so off topic, I'm embarrassing myself. I'm glad you can't see me blushing. Let's get back to the board. Needing to power something in the real world, which requires more punch than this board can provide, happens so frequently, board manufacturers supply relays already built into them. This one happens to have one. The board that came with the kit has three. If you buy a board with no relays on it, like the smooth stepper I use, you'll have to add all of your own. In fact, that is so common, you can buy already made relay boards. What can I say? Some people want to run a lot of foghorns. On this board, this relay is wired to this terminal, these three terminals, where I have these yellow wires attached. There's a screw for common, one for normally open, and the other one for normally closed. To spice things up, the other end of these yellow wires are driving a small spring return air cylinder. Those yellow wires, via the relay on the board, are switching on or off power from the two black wires you see in this image. That thing you're looking at there that interrupts the air line to the cylinder is a solenoid. It's just like the relay we saw before, except in this case, the magnetic coil inside that black part is actuating a valve. The blue tubing you see, of course, is compressed air. The line going off screen is going to my air compressor. Now, if I use the mouse to activate the relay output, the air cylinder should deploy. What we've been talking about here with the inputs and the outputs is very basic signal conditioning. Just like what the drives did for the motors, we're matching what the outputs want, in this case the small DC motor and the pneumatic cylinder, to what the board can handle. Now, the inputs are usually easier since they're typically switches or some kind of low voltage, low current sensor output. But if you set up something like a trip wire between you and your neighbor's yard, hopefully now it's obvious you can't just screw one end of that trip wire into an input terminal. You'd need a switch of some kind, some way to condition that signal 
signal that the trip wire would activate. That in turn sends the signal to the board telling it that your neighbor is out of bounds and only then can relay one release the vat of hot tar or the dogs or the flamethrowers or whatever. All three in my case. There's plenty more we could talk about on the electronic side of things, but for now I think I've done my due diligence and covered some of the basics. We have the motors wired in, we have some inputs and some outputs. Now let's talk about how the computer manages those things. Now for this particular control board I'm connected to the computer via USB. You may recall back in part one I mentioned communications used to happen over the parallel port through a cable like this one. Each one of those pins you see could carry a signal dedicated to whatever you mapped it to. The port would carry five volts in ground somewhere. There'd be step and direction for each motor, perhaps some input pins for limit switches for each axis, one, two, three outputs, one for your spindle, one for coolant, maybe one for air. These would be broken out with a breakout board where you'd have your drives wired, relays, solenoids, that sort of stuff. Apart from the fact that with the parallel port, we were still dealing with the real time aspect of the operating system, it probably doesn't take much imagination to see that you could run out of pins on a cable like this. In that case, you could buy another parallel port card and map two cables, two ports, say port one and port two. Now, I personally never ran out of room on a parallel port, but that was a long time ago. If you start to add a fourth axis and its limit switches, maybe you have a probe or a tool changer, it would start to take a lot of pins. These days with USB or ethernet, that's not really an issue anymore, but the concept is still the same. We have real world hardware connected to the computer via little wires on specific ports and specific pins, and we now need to tell that computer what's what, where things are, where on all our pins are the motors connected or the outputs or the inputs. And this is where we get into software configuration. Just like the hardware, the software can be a contentious issue. Whatever software you decide to use, its purpose is to control the hardware and to act as a G-code translator. That means take G-code, or machine instructions, and turn it into information that can be pushed out of the USB or Ethernet port to the control board. Not counting programming something yourself, there are options here too. I use and will be demonstrating Mach 4 Hobby. This is just what I know. It's what I've always used. I started with Mach 3 and over time upgraded to Mach 4. As we said, some people use Linux CNC. It doesn't take much Googling to find some options. Now, as of today, Mach 4 Hobby will cost you $200 for a license. You can usually bundle it with a controller board and save a few bucks, but it does cost money. But read the docs, check online, see which one is right for you. All right, so here comes the fun part. And by fun, I mean not fun. It's a bit hairy to explain, but I'll try my best. Big picture, we need to get the software to talk to the hardware, whether that's the Smooth Stepper, the PMDX, or whatever. Now, before you can use Mach 4, there's a Mach 4 configuration window. But before you can do anything useful there, your control board will likely have a configuration step of its own. This is where it can get tricky because they all probably look a little bit different. However, they all do the same thing. Tell the hardware what's connected and where. For example, here is the Smooth Stepper screen. We're looking at the Smooth Stepper setup because the PMDX installer did this all for me. That was great for me, but probably isn't of much value to you. Now, this is an older screen. It's just the first screen grab I found, but the concept is the same. Here is where we define where everything is connected. In this example, the X, Y, and Z axis motors are enabled and all wired to port one. And on port one, these are the pins they're physically wired to. X is on pins two and three, Y is on four and five, Z is on six and seven, and so on. You'd do the same exact thing for your input signals and output signals in these other tabs here. Now, one thing you may need to pay attention to is this active high, active low selection. The signals coming in and out of everything are digital. They're ones and zeros, five volts or zero volts. The software itself doesn't care if it's a one or a zero. It's going to just toggle from one to the other when it's commanded to. So if your spindle is off when the signal is low and you wanna turn your spindle on, the software will switch that output from zero to one. Or if it was off when it was one, it would switch it to zero when you wanted to turn the spindle on. So it's just handling a state change as it were. But your hardware on the other hand does care. Your inputs or your outputs might care. Your relay might not turn on if you don't give it five volts. Your stepper drives might also care. My drives are active low. Looks like this lads were too. So here direction and step signals are both set to active low. If you switch those to active high and your drives are expecting active low, well your motors might run backwards or your spindle might always be on when you want it to be off. I suggest reading your hardware specs, leaving all of these at default, and if stuff doesn't work or move, try toggling this first. Instead of active high, make it active low. Now in contrast, 
the PMDX setup screen doesn't really care, doesn't require all of that information. We don't have to do that setup because it's been done for us. The board has screw terminals with labels on it. The assumption is that you wired X, Y, and Z axis into the correct terminals. If you did your part, it already knows where the stuff is connected. The smooth stepper did not, or does not. So in the case of the PMDX 424, I didn't need to worry about ports and pins and where stuff was wired. But nonetheless, in here you can do some advanced configuration stuff if you had to, to tune your system, for example. Now, control boards usually come with a file that set all these ports and pins and inputs and outputs for you, and an instruction sheet that tells you what assumptions it made. In that case, just follow the instructions. Don't wire your vat of hot tar to any old pin and then have to worry about defining it in the software. Instead, see where the software is already assigning, say, output 1, and wire your hot tar there. Again, the goal is to tell the software where everything is physically connected so it knows where to go and when when you tell it to do something. In a nutshell, that was step one of the configuration. Now it's time to get into the machine control side of things. We need to configure Mach 4 so that those inputs and outputs actually mean something machine related. We have motors attached to the control board, but Mach still doesn't know which one of those is X, Y, or Z. It doesn't know that input one is, say, a limit switch and not an emergency stop. When we tell it via G code to turn on the spindle, Mach 4 needs to know which one of those outputs is actually the spindle. Fortunately, with Mach 4, that's relatively easy to do if you just take a deep breath and read through things a piece at a time. We'll go into the Configure menu and select Mach. This, by the way, is where the other configuration screens live. Select Motion Device to actually select and activate the board you're using with Mach. And then in Plugins, you can go in and configure the specific control board. In this case, the PMDX424 Smart Bob or the Smooth Stepper or whatever you have. That'll bring up the screens we were just looking at a moment ago. Once you have all that set up for your particular board, you'll go into Configure and Mock Menu. In the General tab, for now, there are two bits of information critical to making this work. First, set your units. Inch or metric, pick your poison. I'm running in metric just out of habit. Back when I built my CNC router, it uses all metric hardware. It was just easier to think and work in the natural units of the machine, but it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. Next, make sure your control mode is correct. In this case, mill is fine, but if you're making a lathe or a 3D printer, be sure to pick the right one. The rest of this stuff you can work through as you get more familiar with CNC. The motors tab is very important to the setup, but we'll get back to this in just a sec. First, we have to tell it which motor is which and what the inputs and outputs are. And axis mapping is where you define those motors. For a mill, if you're building a standard mill, this is pretty straightforward, I suppose. Motor 0 is X, 1 is Y, and so on. If you're making a lathe, the coordinate system there is a little bit different, so you might want to map motor 0 to Z, for example. But really, it depends on how you laid out your machine and where your motors actually are. Make sure they're enabled and just use the drop-down to select which motor relates to which axis. Homing and limits we won't get into, but this is where you define how homing works, which direction the axes move, and in what order. And finally now for the inputs and the outputs. My suggestion is just work through these one at a time until you get comfortable with what's in each menu. They're relatively self-explanatory. But let's set up the spindle output as an example. I'm on the output signals, and I'm going to scroll down until I find spindle forward. And there it is. You see I've enabled it. It's got the green check mark. Told it which control board it's on. So in this mock configuration, we're equating spindle forward in mock with the relay activation. I can switch that, say to output 2, and make this the relay. Now output 2 doesn't actually have anything wired on it, so I'll go back and make this output 1. Now when Mach 4 issues a spindle command, it'll toggle output 1 on the board. If it gets a coolant on command, it'll toggle the relay. Don't worry about the rest of the tabs for now. When you're done, hit apply. If things don't work, you can always come back in here and make changes. Once you've worked through all your inputs and outputs one by one, you can check that you and Mach are on the same page by going to this Diagnostics tab. These fake LEDs are telling me the status of all the output and input signals. Here's the proximity sensor from before. It's wired in on input 5. So when it gets near something metallic, Mach 4 should now see that signal. Same thing should happen with the button. If you see that light up on some other input, you have something configured wrong, or you don't have the sensor or button wired where you think you have it wired. Once we're happy that everything is wired correctly and defined properly, we can turn our attention to the motors. For now, I've wired the third motor that I got in the kit to the x-axis driver. We'll look at just the motor and then move on to the motor in the system, driving the Etch-a-Sketch. So in the config menu, 
mock and into the motors tab, this is where the motor tuning happens. Now, what you're about to see me do here is specific to my build. Your numbers are likely to be different, but let's work through my example and see what this stuff means. On the screen, we'll define how far your motors should actually move and how fast given your particular setup. There are some values in here that work with my Etch-a-Sketch, but let's start over. We'll do just one motor, motor zero. Again, in my case, this is mapped to the x-axis. The very first box at the bottom is counts per unit. This is asked you how many pulses the computer should send to the X motor driver to make one unit move. That unit might be an inch, might be a millimeter, might be one turn, whatever makes sense for your build. Back in part one, we said this motor is 1.8 degree step per pulse. And to make one turn, we had to send 200 pulses. So let's try that. I'll set the counts per unit in Mach 4 to 200, and we'll tell the x-axis to move one unit. One unit now should be a full turn, 360 degrees, since we're telling it 200 pulses per every unit. Remember, Mach doesn't care what the units are. Here, we're just telling it to go one of them. It won't be until we attach an Etch-a-Sketch, a belt, or a ball screw that we start converting rotations into straight moves that then we could measure in inches or millimeters. I'm going to go into the MDI, the manual data interface, and I'm going to do a G0 move on X x-axis of one unit. We'll get into what those commands mean later, but right now, suffice it to say, I'm telling X to move one unit. I'll hit cycle start and check that out. It only turned 180 degrees. Why not 360? Well, I'd kindly remind you 10% ladies and 90% gentlemen. In the last video, we set this drive to half step. It's a micro stepping drive. The minimum appears to be half. So we need to double the pulse count coming into here from the computer to get the actual pulse count we want out to the motor. Because it's in half step, the motor is actually only moving half of the rated degrees. 200 pulses is netting us 180 degrees. To get a full turn, instead of 200, we need to send it 400 pulses. If we set it to a tenth micro stepping, we'd have to send 2,000 pulses. In the Mach 4 configuration, in the motor configuration, on x-axis, we should have put in 400 units. If I now reissue the x1 command with the motor set to 400 pulses per unit, let's see if that fixed the problem. And there it is, micro stepping in action. The drive now was able to divide those 360 degrees from the motor's natural 200 divisions to 400 divisions. Now let's turn our attention to the actual machine setup, the Etch-a-Sketch and the pulleys. I mean, we now know that 400 counts or 400 steps results in one complete turn of the motor, of that aluminum pulley that you see. In the case of the Etch-a-Sketch, when we draw something here, or a mill apart if you're building a mill, we want the motors to turn in such a way that its turns result in real-world units. We don't want to just turn that knob four times. We want to turn it enough times such that the line that the Etch-a-Sketch draws is, say, one inch long, or 25 millimeters or one mile, whatever you mean for your machine to do. So 400 pulses does one turn on this aluminum knob. I know that turning the Etch-a-Sketch knob one turn results in a line that's one and three eighths inch long, 35 millimeters, more or less. I know that because I turned the knob once and I measured on the screen the length of the line that I got. So we know how many counts makes one full turn of the motor and we know how long a line we get when we make one full turn of the knob. We just now have to relate those two. Now in my case, I'm using a pulley, a little o-ring. I put some masking tape on the knob. Those are really smooth polypropylene and my o-ring was slipping sometimes. Not because it couldn't drive it, it was literally slipping off of the taper on that knob. Anyway, I made this pulley half the diameter of this knob. So we've got a two to one relationship here. When this makes one full turn, the Etch-a-Sketch knob only makes a half a turn. So in order to get a 35 millimeter or one and three eighths inch line on the Etch-a-Sketch, I have to turn this twice. I have to turn the motor twice. Now you can do the math. In fact, you should do the math. I did the math to get get me in the ballpark. We're trying to figure out how many pulses need to go into that motor to result in one unit of drawn line on our Etch-a-Sketch. And that's what we're trying to do here. Now, I didn't go crazy with the math here, but it wasn't completely right on my first try just because the diameters of these pulleys, well, isn't exactly the diameter I machined them or the diameter I measured them. You know, there's an O-ring here with some thickness that impacts the effective diameters. And, you know, my one test turn of the knob was as close as I could get to one turn when I measured it. You keep finding tuning that count number until you get the measurement that you want, but I wanted to share with you a little wizard that's in Mach 4 that helps you find out what that number should be. In the software, you can go to wizard, select wizard, and scroll down until you find steps per unit calculator. Now here we're working with the x-axis, so I have that selected. 
This is the steps that actually work with my Etch-a-Sketch, but for argument's sake, let's say we did the math and that came out to 19. That current steps per unit should be the number that's actually in the motor tuning tab. This doesn't actually change anything in the software. This is just a calculator to help you out. This box called Move Distance is prompting us for the units we'd like to move. An Etch-a-Sketch, a lathe tool, a mill tool. In this case, I'll make it 40 millimeters. The longer you make it, probably the easier to measure and the more accurate this calculator would be. Move velocity, I wasn't sure what this number should be for an Etch-a-Sketch. I had to look it up in the machinery's handbook. For my Etch-a-Sketch, 450 units per minute or 450 millimeters per minute seemed about decent. Now I'm going to enable the machine and I'm going to press the incremental move button. Now I can measure that line. I actually got I don't know, 27 millimeters. So in the wizard where it says actual move distance, I'll type in 27. Hit recalculate and it'll tell me what my steps per unit should actually be. 22.2222, etc. So I would go back into the motor tuning, go to the x-axis motor, put in that value 22.22222. Hit apply and then I'd do the same exact calculation for my Y knob for motor 1. Now look, I totally get it, but this isn't going to work if you keep moving around. Holy smokes, that sure was a lot of talking to do in one continuous breath. Fun trivia fact, I narrate all my videos start to finish without ever moving my lips. That was my crash course in setting up a basic CNC. Well, using Mach 4 anyway. Again, I'd expect just about any system to work more or less the same way. My intention at this point was to get into some of the G code, but frankly, I'm blue in the face and a little parched. I ran out of Sanka back at the pneumatic cylinder bit. Generally, you can get G code into your system one of three or four Four ways. First, you could write it yourself in the MDI or in Notepad or wherever, then load it into the software. Second, and probably more common these days, use a CAM package like Fusion 360 or HSM. Those will generate much more sophisticated G code than you could likely write by hand, sometimes more complicated than you might need. Then there are wizards or plugins you can get for most CNC controller software that automate things like pockets and slots, facing and bolt hole patterns, the sorts of things you might run across often. At least for a CNC mill or router anyway. For the sketching I did here in this video, I used Fusion 360's engrave feature or engrave tool. The lines you saw crisscrossing in the G-code in the drawings are the moves that would have repositioned the tool if this thing, this Etch-a-Sketch, had a third axis. Though you can't easily lift the pen on an Etch-a-Sketch, so I ended up with lines for the tool moves. Yes, you could edit the code to backtrack on lines it's already made, but come on, cut me a break here. If you'd like to get some big picture basics on G-code, you might like my two videos on C CNC basics. I can't recommend them enough. And trust me, they do live up to their name. I'll leave a link down below. To get in deeper, be sure to check out John's videos over at NYC CNC. He seems mostly to work with Fusion, but the basics are all the same. I've also been seeing a lot of comments about the titans of CNC. Thought I'd mention them too. I've only had a look through their video catalog. Titles look promising and plan to tuck into some of them myself soon. One last thing for now though. Backlash. Backlash is lost motion in any mechanical system, known on the streets as slop. It's everywhere in everything mechanical and is the bane of CNC, mostly homebrew CNC. It will snap your end mills and ruin your parts without mercy. Now we're at my lathe. I'm going to use my cross slide as an example. This is the handle that turns the screw that drives the cutting tool towards or away from the work. If I wind my tool in towards the work, the backlash in the screw in this case is taken up. Now I can really crank hard on this and the screw inside will keep pushing. But the minute I change directions, the nut inside, or the screw in the nut, has to shift. It has to move to the other side of the screw lands. That clearance, or that wear, between the screw and the nut in this case, I can feel as wobble in the hand wheel. That is backlash. In my particular case, going by feel, that's about 15 or 20 thou, almost half a millimeter. On a manual lathe, within reason, that isn't a problem. I can feel it. That, and you're usually cutting into the work either reducing the length or reducing the diameter. On a mill, it's a little more dangerous. There, there's often a lot of switching direction. If that happens during a cut, the cutting tool can shift in your work, suddenly taking up that backlash on its own, and usually breaking a tool in the process. On a CNC machine, however, it's a completely different story. If the G-code tells the motor to back up, say, 10 thou in this case, the motor will do it, 
but the tool won't have actually moved. The motor move was lost in the backlash. The CNC machine, however, doesn't know that. In fact, even if you were using servo motors, it still wouldn't know. The motor has done the move that you asked it to. And if you're doing a ton of small moves, you can bet your bottom dollar you'll see that backlash in the finished part, if you even get that far. And the Etch-a-Sketch, you may be as surprised to learn this as I was, has quite a bit of backlash. At least mine does. You can wiggle the knobs without actually moving the cursor. On top of that, it's been getting worse the more I draw with the CNC. And Y is much worse than X. I've never had one of these apart, but I guess it has little plastic wires or lines inside moving the cursor. Maybe they're stretching a bit, or the mechanism in the Y knob is dying. Again, that's not a problem when you're using this by hand, probably the way it was meant to be used, because you're looking at the drawing. You see the cursor. If it's not exactly where you think you want it, you'd compensate with your hands. The computer can't do that. Let me show you something. I'm going to run some simple G-code that draws a circle, 60 millimeters in diameter in this case, and I'll run it three times consecutively. Notice how it's not exactly circular anymore. It was a few days ago, and now it's slowly falling apart. When it's done, the computer thinks it's going back to where it started, but Backlash has it losing its way. Everything in this case is slowly creeping down with every reversal of the Y knob. I'm sure the X isn't doing so hot either. Now, some of that might also be the O-ring slipping. Maybe my masking tape is glazing over. But whatever it is, if you have backlash in your system, you've got to take care of it. A CNC control software like Mach 4 do offer backlash compensation. You can turn it on in software and tell it how much backlash each of your axes have. What it tries to do, I think, is make all cutting moves from the same direction. Again, in the case of a router or a lathe. Sort of the same way you might do it on an old worn out milling machine. You'll have to make sure the control board you're using supports that feature, but in my experience, it's best to avoid it altogether. If you need software compensation for backlash, you have a problem with your machine. Stop what you're doing and fix the machine. Anyway, I think that's all I've got for this part. And no, the point of these videos wasn't to CNC and Etch-a-Sketch. I think I'll end up making something with these things sooner or later. Maybe we'll convert a small benchtop lathe. I think I'll do a third part sometime to this this video on actual machine design, but that's a big subject. We'll see how it goes. As always, if you made it this far, what do you think? <laughs> no, don't talk. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs>